The Word of God is a sure foundation that has stood the test of time. Sadly, millions have built their religion on the ever-shifting sands of human opinion. Jesus warned only those who anchor their faith on the unchanging rock of His Word will stand through the coming storm. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Here We Stand, Foundations of Our Faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy and wonderful is your name. Here we stand in your presence, seeking your truth. Here we stand, give us godly wisdom as we study your words. Here we stand on the brink of eternity. Help us to fight the good fight. Help us to keep the faith and may we build our foundation on you. In the name of Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, amen. amen. You may be seated. It's good to see each of you here this evening. And for those who are here in uh, Lansing, Michigan, I'd like to extend to you, um, I think it's still Sabbath, happy Sabbath. And uh, we are going to be talking about that subject a little bit tonight. And we have some Bible questions that have been coming in from around the country and around the world. And uh, Pastor Ross, maybe we should get right into that because I've seen some of them and all we've right. got a lot we can say. Very good. Well, our first question this evening comes all the way from Switzerland. So this group watching there, what is the distinction between the Old and the New Covenant? We actually had several questions that seem to uh, imply an interest in better understanding that. Last night we talked a little bit about the Ten Commandments, and naturally a person might want to know, well, where is the distinction between the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament and the New Testament for the Christian, or the New Covenant? You know, your Bible is divided in two sections. You've got what they call the Old Testament, that means covenant, and the New Testament, that's about where the division would be. Oh, wait, I'm in Daniel, hang on here. Anyway, you've got three quarters of the Bible in the Old Testament, and then you've got about a quarter of the Bible in the New Testament. What's the difference between the two? The Old Testament you find in Deuteronomy chapter 4 where it says, I declared unto them my covenant, ten commandments, and I wrote them on two tables of stone. The Old Testament is the ten commandments, and the people, the old covenant, the people said, after the Lord declared the ten commandments, and you can find this in Exodus chapter 20, they said, all the Lord has said, we will do. We're making an agreement. You've said this is our covenant, we agree, we'll do it. But before Moses got down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, they were already worshiping a golden calf and probably breaking all ten of them. Now God says, I'll make a new covenant. Who knows where you first find the new covenant? You first find the new covenant in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, nobody is saved under the Old Covenant. We're all saved based on the new covenant. The new covenant is the law of God written in the heart. Nobody is saved by works. Everybody is saved by faith. God simply allowed them to discover in the Old Testament that you cannot do anything without Him. But everybody who is saved is saved by faith. The New Covenant, God says, you can find this in Jeremiah 31, 31. It's repeated in Hebrews chapter 8. A new covenant I will make after those days with the house of Israel. I will write my law in their hearts. Notice the difference. God is now writing the law in the heart instead of stone. And he goes on to say, and I will cause them to walk in my ways and keep my statutes. Before they said, we will do it. The new covenant says, I will do it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. All right, the next question that we have, is there a right and a wrong way to study the Bible? Well, first of all, uh, one wrong way to study the Bible is to attempt to study it without prayer. We need to uh, make sure and ask God's help when we study his word. 
Some people study the Bible, it's sort of like bingo. And they, they flip the Bible open and they just uh, start looking for different verses. And, uh, you know, I, I heard about one lady that uh, she was praying about whether or not to marry somebody. And she just prayed and she flipped open the Bible and said, if he bids thee, go with him. So she married him. Well, fortunately for her, it worked out. But I don't recommend making your decisions based on that. So that's one of the wrong ways. You shouldn't use the Bible as though it's some kind of a lucky charm. Um, the right way to study the Bible is to pray first. You can study it by book. It's good to get an overview. Uh, do your best to read through the panorama of Bible history. You might start with Genesis, Exodus, and then go to the books of Samuel and Kings. Read the New Testament, the Gospels, and that gives you the story as a backdrop. You can study it by a subject, and especially today with computer programs, you can search the Bible so quickly to find different subjects. You can study it by book and themes, and uh, we'll say more. You know, one thing we might recommend is get a set of Bible study guides. Uh, Amazing Facts has a set of 27 Bible study guides that have been very popular. Matter of fact, we're just reprinting them right, right now. And you could go through the Amazing Facts Bible study course. Just go to Amazing Facts. You can do it online for free, or you can order them. Okay, the next question. When is the best time of the day to study the Bible, and how long should I study the Bible? Well, that probably varies a little from person to person. Uh, just show of hands, how many of you consider yourselves a morning person? Okay, now shown by the same sign, how many of you consider yourselves sort of a night person? You start waking up, see that? Some of you, you just, you, you just don't really get your engine warmed up until about 8 p.m. And then you start feeling very energetic. Now, Karen and I are sort of opposites that way. She becomes very industrious about the time I'm winding down. <laughs> and uh, I wake up early, and my mind is clear, and I feel very uh, energized in the morning, and that's the best time for me. You know, in the Bible, uh, typically, it says they were to go out and get the manna early in the morning. Uh, I recommend mornings for Bible study, at least some Bible study, because you're going to need it that day. It's, they say, you know, a lot of people get in the habit of missing breakfast. You shouldn't miss your Bible breakfast. I found thy words, and I did eat them. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by what? Every word. And so I think it's good to start with a nutritious breakfast and read a few verses, and it'll vary how much, depending on um, perhaps a little less for children. More as you get older, you're able to digest more, and we'll say more about that. Okay, what resources can you suggest to help me study the Bible? Well, I guess I jumped the gun on that one. I, I mentioned, for one thing, um, you can go to the computer, and there are so many good things. You can, there's free concordances. There's free Bible software that you can download on the computer. We mentioned that there's uh, study guides that you can get. Amazing Facts not only has our, our basic 27, we've got the historical lessons. There's the Discover Bible lessons and uh, many others. But study with uh, a set of lessons. How many of you have heard of the Conflict of the Ages series? Mm -hmm. Best Bible study I ever had best preparation for ministry that I ever had was starting with patriarchs and prophets and going through great controversy with the Bible in my hands. That's the best Bible study, and go at your own pace. Sort of a follow-up question on that one. Is there a particular version that we should use when studying the Bible? Well, um, some of us are going to probably have varying opinions on that. I, I think for it's one thing to read the Bible just to get the overview. And there are some more modern translations that help you in more modern language get that. And when I first was up in the mountains reading the Bible, I had a very simple version. It's probably what I needed at that time. But now I really like the King James and the New King James version. It stays very true to the original text. Uh, some of the modern translations take liberties that make me nervous when it comes to being exact with theology. But I'm sure a lot of people out there and even pastors would differ with Pastor Doug on that. So some of that is, is going to rest on opinions. Okay, next question. How do I have family worship with my children? Well, you, first of all, you have to pace it for their age. Obviously, when they're very little, you have prayer with them. You do s things that are simple they can appreciate. You don't want it to be long and tedious because their attention span is shorter. As they mature, you can lengthen it. You can make it a little deeper. Uh, we go through a set of study guides with our children in the morning. And then we just have a general family prayer uh, in the evening before we go to bed. And sometimes you do prayer requests with them, and they can see their prayers being answered. 
I think we have time for one more, Pastor Doug. Here it is. What should I expect will happen if I spend regular time studying the Bible? Oh, good question. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You cannot be saved without faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Faith comes through the Word. Before I started reading the Bible, maybe I should back up and just tell you, for those who may not know, I was raised pretty much an atheist and um, read a lot of religious books. I was living in the mountains by myself and found a Bible up in this cave I was living in, started reading the Bible with no intention of believing it. I thought it was just a collection of fables and just changed my life, and that's been over 30 years ago. So, it, and the, it came from reading the Word. You cannot be saved without love. And you don't love someone you don't know. You get to know the Lord through His Word. You get to know someone through communication. You speak to them, they speak to you. That's prayer is when we speak to the Lord. His Word is the primary way He speaks to us. When you know Him, you'll love Him. When you love Him, you'll want to obey Him. Welcome once again, friends. I want to welcome especially those who have joined us tonight via satellite for this special presentation. Here we stand, and we're talking about the Word of God and some of the foundational teachings of Christian truth that have been lost to the greater extent by Christendom. Now, last night we talked about a very important subject dealing with salvation, the law of God, trying to better understand the relationship between these two very important issues. And normally when you talk about the Ten Commandments, uh, most people don't have a problem until you get to one in particular, and that's the Fourth Commandment. Now, this meeting is being presented in a special sense to help people better understand who are Seventh-day Adventists, what do they believe? What are the distinctive differences? Why do they believe that? And of course, it's also a call to revival among God's people to take a stand for biblical truth and to hold your ground. Amen? When you think about uh, Pentecostals, what specific doctrine often pops into your mind? Tongues, I hear you saying it. Speaking in tongues, glossolalia. When you think about Baptists, well, just by the title, you might think about baptism by immersion. Others might go a little deeper and think about um, predestination or uh, once saved, always saved. That's sometimes a label that is associated with Baptist theology. If you talk about the Catholic Church, some might think about the Mass or confession or some of the other um, prominent teachings that are unique. And obviously, when someone mentions the Seventh-day Adventist Church, one of the things that's at the forefront is what? It's the Sabbath. Sometimes people will ask me, what church do you belong to? I'll say, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. What do they believe? The Bible. <laughs> uh, we don't, you know, I am not a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church because somebody faxed me a creed one day or because I was raised in this church it just happened that when I read the Bible and began to search for a church that was as close to the Bible as it could be, I mean, that's what you want to support, right? I had nowhere else to go. Now, that doesn't mean everybody within any specific church is perfect. There are good people in every denomination. Every denomination has some folks that they wish would not get out in public. You know what I mean? And that's normal. You can't really judge them by that. But you know, the foundational teachings are the, the important issue. But when you think about Seventh-day Adventists, the first teaching that comes to mind is, of course, the Seventh-day Sabbath. And it was amazing to me how people would cringe when I first began to learn these things and I was a baby Christian worshiping in different fellowships. I, I kept wondering about it, and I'd go to a variety of pastors and I'd say, why do we go to church on Sunday? And they all gave me different answers, which made me suspicious. One would say, well, we go to church on Sunday because Jesus rose on the first day of the week and it's the Christian Sabbath, it's the New Testament Sabbath. I said, well, that sounds good, but where's the scripture? Well, there really is no specific scripture, but we have a long-standing tradition. We've been doing this for, you know, 1,500 years or more. 
Oh, well, that's not a good reason. Where's the Bible reason? I mean, what's going to be the foundation for what we stand for? It's the scriptures. How else can you defend it? I go to another pastor, I'd say, why do we go on Sunday? And they'd say, well, it really doesn't matter what day you go. <laughs> Just don't go on Saturday. Because we're not under the law, now we're under grace. I actually was doing a meeting like this when a minister who was attending interrupted the meeting. And I'll never forget this. And um, he said, Pastor Doug, you're putting, I was preaching on the Sabbath truth. He said, you're putting all these people under a yoke of bondage. You're putting them under works, telling them they've got to keep the old laws. And I said, um, brother, I mean, there was a smaller group, and so we began to have a dialogue right there in the middle of the meeting. I said, brother, do you believe God wants us to keep the Ten Commandments or not? And some of his parishioners were there at the meeting, so he was sensitive to that. And he said, no. And then they, he could hear the gasp. His members went, you don't believe we should keep the Ten Commandments? And they realized that that would include the other nine, and that didn't sound right. And so he said, yes. And then he thought, well, that's going to include the Sabbath. So then he said, nine of them. <laughs> and so I said, you're telling me, in other words, the one commandment you think we should forget is the only one that begins with the word remember. <laughs> and I said, I don't think it's fair that you're accusing me of putting these people under a yoke of works because I'm telling them to rest. You're telling them not to rest. You're telling them to work. And so I kept hearing all that. And then one fellow I talked to was very creative. So why do we go to church on Sunday? He said, back in the days of Joshua, the sun stood still, Saturday became Sunday. <laughs> and of course, I said, well, then why for the next thousand years did they still keep it on the seventh day? And he couldn't answer that. And there are a hundred other answers. But it just, just about any church you go to and you say, why do you go on Sunday? It, it, a lot of double talk. You don't hear... A scripture, matter of fact, I, on many occasions, I'm not afraid to do it now. I've turned a camera around in a big audience and I said, please show me one scripture that commands us to keep the first day of the week holy as the Sabbath. I'm never afraid to ask that question. I mean, you know, who knows what someone might say, but there is no scripture. I'm not afraid of someone giving me a scripture. There isn't any. But there are plenty of scriptures that command us to keep the seventh day holy as the Sabbath. Now, I wouldn't make such a big deal about this, except if the Ten Commandments were spoken by God's voice and written by God's finger, if there is something worth standing for, that would be among that group of things for which you should be willing to stand. We illustrated last night that the heroes of the Bible, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, were willing to die rather than disobey one of God's commandments. Is he going to want less from his people in the last days? Well, tonight the subject is going to be dealing with specifically the Sabbath truth. I welcome your questions. Once again, I want to remind our friends who are watching, hope you tape this program, share it with your friends. If any of your Christian friends want to know why Seventh-day Adventists keep the seventh day, I hope to cover as much as I can in this presentation. Our message is going to be the rest of the story. And the reason I titled it the rest of the story is because we're going to be talking about rest. Now, there are two great New Testament utterances by Jesus. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 11, and he tells us in verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, first you come to Jesus, then the other, you've got one is the great invitation, we just quoted, the other is the great commission, go ye therefore and teach all nations, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. You come to Jesus, and then you go for Jesus. You come to Jesus, love for God, you go for Jesus, love for your fellow man. In coming to Jesus, we embrace rest. That is the spirit of the law. That is the spirit of the Sabbath commandment. It's all about finding that rest from laying our burdens down. But the big question people grapple with is, 
That's fine and well, Pastor Doug, but is it necessary for New Testament Christians to actually keep the seventh day Sabbath? Well, let's find out what the Bible says. Do you believe what the Bible says? Yes. We're going to look at a lot of scripture. I've got my Bible here. I hope you don't think it's just a prop because most of the scriptures I've got are on the screen because I want people to be able to record this and look at it again. Let's start with the commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. This is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. It's the longest of the Ten Commandments. It's the only commandment that begins with the word remember, implying God knew we might be prone to forget. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. For, here's why, in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now that's the commandment. Remember, they are not called the Ten Suggestions or the Ten Recommendations when the Almighty Creator of the cosmos says, this is my will, do this. Then he wants us to do it. Not just to be hearers, but doers of the law. You know, one of the most prominent crimes in the world today is called identity theft. Have you been hearing more and more about identity theft? And the odds of someone being a victim are just going up exponentially. And uh, I won't, well, maybe I will. How many of you have had somebody uh, abuse your personal information, credit card, something, all of a sudden you had to cancel a card, someone got some numbers. Look, at you can see hands right here. It's becoming more and more common. People get a hold of your credit card information or your driver's license or some of the personal invitation, a, a, a social security number. And these, boy, I tell you, these con artists are very shrewd. They get on the phone and they call people that are believing and, and they trust folks. And they say, we're calling from the credit card department and we, it appears that someone's stolen your information. Can you please confirm your card number? Confirm. And they're very smooth. And they get you to offer up this stuff. And then they take it and they go on a spending spree before it's discovered. And sometimes they even assume someone else's identity for a long period of time and they commit crimes, cash checks under another person's name. And all of a sudden someone's carried off to jail and they say, what did I do? And they take sometimes months for them to discover it was someone else who had stolen their identity, that committed the crimes. And boy, it can be difficult. It can take years to clear your name and your credit from this identity theft. I heard about one man the FBI caught up with, Abraham Abdallah. And uh, he was a busboy, 32 years old. He managed to get the personal information of Bill Gates, Ted Turner, Oprah Winfrey, George Lucas. When they arrested him, he had managed to somehow bamboozle the banks and the credit agencies out of $80 million. Busboy, high school dropout. And he had 800 credit cards I guess he never got enough, huh? Some of you have only got 400. Can you imagine having 800? <laughs> if I filled out every application that I get for a credit card, I'd, I'd have 800 too. 800 credit cards. And he had a credit card making machine. Identity theft. Well, you know, the devil has bamboozled the Christian church by stealing the identity of something that God set aside as holy and putting a different time and a different label on it. And he's assumed it for himself. And most of the Christian church has been fooled by this. We'll find out more about what I'm talking about specifically. Question number one. We already know what the subject is. What is the Sabbath day? Well, I'm going to give you a whole series of verses dealing with this truth. Of course, it was on the Sabbath day that God rested from his work of creation. For six days, God created the world. And he made different things on those six days. What did he make on the seventh day? He made a day. The only thing he made on the seventh day was the Sabbath. Do we still need everything else God made on those other six days? Then why would we think the only thing he made on the seventh day is no longer needed? Let's read it. Genesis chapter 2. Sabbath goes back to creation. It's part of God's perfect plan. There was no sin in the world at this time. 
On the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. He rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. The Sabbath is this holy sphere of time that dates back to the very beginning. Now you'll notice in the commandment it says that on the Sabbath day that God rested, he blessed it, and he sanctified it. Man was made in the image of God. God has asked us to follow his pattern of embracing the rest. Come to me, Jesus says, and you'll have rest. The blessing, he's blessed this day above every other day, and so many people are missing the blessing because you must capitalize on that by faith. You must claim it. It's there whether you believe it or not. The seventh day is the Sabbath, whether you've ever known it or not, whether you believe it or not, that doesn't change it. If you don't believe the seventh day is the Sabbath, it's not going to affect that truth. The truth is the truth whether you believe it or not. And God, and he sanctified it. He made it holy. And when God tells us something is holy, it's still holy. Two institutions in the Garden of Eden. God established marriage and he established the Sabbath truth. Because all love relationships flourish in the dimension of time. Love requires quality time in order for it to be enjoyed, in order for it to grow deeper and stronger. The reason the devil hates the Sabbath truth is he knows if he can get people so busy with the cares of life that they will not be thinking about that quality time, that appointment we've got with God, where our relationship with him is to grow, it's to be nurtured, it's to be nourished. Not only that, people need physical rest. I've heard a number of reports from the military. They've tried all kinds of tests about how, what is the endurance of man. And they even tried going on a 10-day 10 10 day work week for the troops and they said, the ideal schedule is six days of work, one day of rest. God knew what he was talking about. And then you consider, especially in our age now, all of the stress that people grapple with. More than any other time in the history of the world today, people struggle with stress. People are all stressed out. Let me read some, there's some um, scientific data that I think is, is worthy of uh, sharing with you. A Cornell University study of working couples confirms that detrimental effects that work-related stress has on families. Married couples with children burdened by long hours of paid work report the lowest quality of life among working couples. Additionally, catch this, 43% of all adults suffer adverse health effects from stress. I wish I could say I was totally immune. And 75% to 90% of all physician office visits are attributed, did you catch that? 75 to 90% of all physician office visits are attributed to stress-related ailments or complaints, according to the American Psychological Association. Stress is linked to the six leading causes of death in the United States. Stress is related to heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, accidents, cirrhosis of the liver, suicide, the, the pharmacy, so many of the drugs that are sold over the counter, everything from sleeping pills to antacids are related to stress. And I wonder if there's a connection between man forgetting that God said rest and to enjoy the rest that he has told us to enjoy in, in the Sabbath time. Every Sabbath day is not only a time for us to let the uh, pressure of the stress go away, just to lay your burdens down. Jesus says, Come to me. I'll help you with your burdens. I'll give you rest. The Sabbath is a renewing of that relationship every week. It's also a memorial of creation. You see, every time you remember the Sabbath day, you remember that in six days God created. It is a constant memorial that God is our creator. You can also find that in Ezekiel. It's, it tells us that he gave us the Sabbath day as a sign of redemption. Not only it reminds us that he is our creator, that he made us, it reminds us that he redeemed us. For instance, you can look in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13. Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it shall be a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you might know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. And a moment ago I cited Ezekiel. It's chapter 20, verse 20. Hallow my Sabbaths, 
and they shall be a sign between me and you that you might know that I am the Lord your God. Did it stop being a sign that he is our redeemer and our creator at some point? Or is that a perpetual sign? That's why God told us in the commandment, remember to keep the Sabbath day. To keep it what? To keep it holy. Now think about this for a moment, please. If I were to ask you where in the world is the holy land, what would you say? Israel, okay? In the holy land, where would you say is the holy city? What city would that be? Jerusalem, I heard you. If I were to ask you, is there a holy mountain in Jerusalem, what would that be? Mount Zion, sometimes called Mount Moriah. You're right, they call it the holy mount. What was built on that holy mountain? The holy temple was there, that's correct. In the holy temple, they had the holy place. You still with me? And in the holy place, there was the holy of holies. So we've got a, like a target. You got the world, and then you got the holy land. You got the holy city, the holy mountain, the holy temple, the holy place, the holy of holies. What was the one article of furniture in the holy of holies? The Ark of the Covenant. The holy ark. And what was in the holy ark? the holy law. And in the law, you can take your computer and search it, you find the word holy one time. Where do you suppose you find it? It's in the middle of the law in the Sabbath commandment. So when people try to get rid of that one commandment, they're taking the one place in the law of God. That is like a bullseye in the law of God on the planet. Why would God make such a big deal about the Sabbath? Because you and I live in something called time. If you have no more time, that's bad news. Isn't that right? We live in time. And the Sabbath is a memorial that God gives us life, that he redeems us, that relationships are built in time. The devil hates it. Because as we spend time with God, we get to know God. As we get to know him, we love him. As we get to know him better, we love him better. And if you love him, then you obey him. You can't obey him if you don't know him and you don't love him. Does that make sense? So the devil hates that because this is where people find the power to live the Christian life. It's in the relationship with Jesus, and the Sabbath is all about that relationship, that love, that time, that quality time with God. It is not a Jewish law. Now, my mother was Jewish, grew up understanding a lot about the religion, but one thing that's real clear to me is the Bible teaches that the Sabbath is for everybody. What did Jesus say? Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for for man. That would have been an easy place to say the Sabbath is made for Jews or for Hebrews or Israelites. He doesn't say that. He says the Sabbath was made for man. Because, and you know what else? He's tracing it back to the Garden of Eden when after God made man on the sixth day, then he made time for man with God. The very next thing he made was the Sabbath. Every man needs it. Everybody in the world is related to Adam. And if you're not related to Adam, I'd like to talk to you later. <clears throat> Need to have your DNA checked. You know what else God made for man? Woman. God said it's not good that man should be alone, so he made a woman. So here's the question. Do we still need women? Do we still need the Sabbath? I always get extra votes when I do it that way. <laughs> Let's read this verse. Isaiah 56, verse 6. All, the Sabbath is not just for one race. Listen to this. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him. These are strangers, aliens, non-Jews. To love the name of the Lord. To be his servants. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. He's not even talking about the general Sabbath days. He says the Sabbath. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. It's for everybody. In the early days of the church, when people converted to Christianity, they embraced the Sabbath along with the other principles of the Bible. It's a time for corporate worship. We need that. We need to come together to fellowship, to edify and build each other up. And the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 23 that the Sabbath is a holy convocation. That word convocation means, it's like where you get the word convention. It means an assembly, a convening, a coming together. And yet sometimes I meet people, even Sabbath keepers, 
And by the way, Seventh-day Adventists, we, can't, we don't have a patent on the Sabbath truth. Many different churches out there today that have learned the Sabbath truth. Matter of fact, I got a call, what, two, three weeks ago, Bonnie, from a pastor. I won't say his name. I don't want to put him on the spot. Lives in Austin, Austin Texas, Pentecostal Church of God pastor, studying our material, watching the programs, accepted the Sabbath truth, presented it to his church. The majority of his church accepted it. They said it's in the Bible. This is a truth that's spreading everywhere. I mean, we don't, we don't have a patent on this. And so it, it does matter. It is important. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It says here in, uh, of course, Exodus chapter 20, verses uh, 8 and on, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. You notice God didn't say, remember the Sabbath day and start keeping it holy. He said, keep it holy. That means it is holy. He's asking us to keep what he has made holy, holy. Let me illustrate. If you come to my home and I say, I live in a cold climate and it's winter, and I say, could you just go, you know, watch the house for a few minutes, got to run to the store, can you keep the fire going? No problem, Doug. I say, there's the wood box, can you keep the fire going? No problem. So I leave and you think, well, I better check the fire, and you go over and you open up the stove. There's no fire. It's just cold ashes. And you're thinking to yourself, why did Doug say keep the fire going if there's no fire? The very fact that I say keep the fire going implies there is a fire, you just keep it going. God is saying the Sabbath is holy. It did not start being holy with Moses. Some people think that God dreamed it up for the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. That's, they just don't know their Bibles very well. It goes all the way back to Adam. And proof of that would be, if you go to Exodus chapter 16, when the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt before they ever got to Mount Sinai, it says, Moses said to them, remember they rained the bread down from heaven? Moses said to them, eat today what they've gathered, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. They would go out five days a week. They'd gather manna. On the sixth day, they'd gather twice as much because there would be no manna on the Sabbath day. Yet on the Sabbath day, some still went out looking for manna. And God said, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments? Now notice you find the manna story in Exodus 16. You don't get to Mount Sinai until Exodus 20. God was saying the Sabbath is one of my laws before they ever got to Mount Sinai. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. We all need rest. That's not just a Jewish need. That's absurd for people to say that this is, this is a Jewish law. What, did God get it wrong at creation? He had to change it later? It was part of his perfect plan. What about the New Testament would mean there was something wrong with the day? Which brings me to my next question. You need to pray for me. I'm on question two out of 30 questions. No, it's not that question. <laughs> Half my time is gone. No, it's not that many. I think I've got maybe a dozen. Which day of the week is the Sabbath? We'll go quicker now. I've already told you, but let's read it one more time. It says, Genesis chapter 2, on the, say it with me, seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. He rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and he had done. First time in the Bible any number is mentioned three times is in connection with the Sabbath. It says the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. Now, if you've got caveman theology, whenever you hear a number like that 777, what pops into my mind is what's the mark of the beast? 666. One of the identifying marks, we just read, one of the signs, one of the seals that you belong to God is the Sabbath. That number, seven, is a sign that you are resting in the Lord. You're trusting in Him. Now, you notice God didn't, see, he didn't say, keep a seventh day. And I, this is one of the most common arguments. After I start studying with people, it's interesting to watch people keep changing their positions to avoid the Sabbath truth. Okay, wait a second. Let me just say something here. I always forget this. I get so worked up over this subject. I forget how it disturbed me when I first heard it. Please forgive me, friends, if I'm not being gracious. I know it can be very disturbing when people hear this. It's such a compelling, for me, it seems to be such compelling evidence that some people are blown away and they don't know what to do. Because accepting the Sabbath truth for them can mean losing their friends, their fellowship, uh, they could be put out of their church. They can lose their jobs. It can mean tremendous change in their lives. 
And I've also noticed that when people discover the Sabbath truth, they start going through a struggle because they begin to say, can I afford to believe this? I'd like to plead with you right now, don't think that way. Open your heart, open your mind and say, Lord, first let me just ask the honest questions, is it true? Be open to the logic of God's word. It says, come let us reason together. Use your head, ask yourself if it makes sense, if it's true, then say, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do about it, but please give me grace and guide me. God does not send the Sabbath truth to be a burden for you. He sends it to be a blessing. He doesn't want it to be a problem. It's a privilege. And so just look at this honestly. Amen? He doesn't say keep a Sabbath, uh, Sabbath day. It's like if I were to say, can you bring me a chair? Well, you could grab any old chair. It doesn't matter what color it is and bring it to me. But if I say, bring me the chair, well, you know I'm talking about a specific chair. It doesn't say a seventh day is a Sabbath. God says the seventh day. Isn't that what he says? And he means what he says. He's God. Now, if you have any doubts and you think I'm teaching something biased, there's no question about what the seventh day is. It's what we commonly call Saturday. If you don't believe Pastor Doug, maybe you believe Webster. You look at Webster's Dictionary, Saturday, the seventh day of the week. It's very simple. And if you're wondering, well, what is Sunday? I thought Sunday was the seventh day. No, Sunday, the first day of the week. You check on me. Now, sometimes people juggle calendars a little bit, depending on what country you're in, but it doesn't change the days of the week. And I can set up my computer where it starts on the working days of Monday, but that doesn't make Monday the first day of the week. People do all kinds of things trying to juggle that. Some people say, well, Doug, nobody really knows anymore what was the seventh day of creation because after all, calendars been changed many times and who knows anymore. Have you heard that argument before? That is a myth. That is absurd when you really think about it. Has the calendar been changed? Many times the months and dates on the calendar have been changed. That never has any effect on the days of the week. I'll show you in just a minute what I'm talking about. Someone wrote years ago the U.S. Naval Observatory with this question asking if the changes in the calendar in recent years have affected the weekly cycle. And they responded from the U.S. Naval Observatory, there has been no change in the continuity of the weekly cycle since long before the Christian era. The continuity of the weekly cycle, meaning first, second, third, fourth, sixth, sixth, seventh day of the week. I missed the fifth, sorry fifth, sixth, seventh day of the week, and it just keeps cycling. For instance, there was a change in the calendar. We're now living under the Gregorian calendar, and I think it was 1582, Pope Gregory the 13th changed, and it was like October 5th, Friday. The next day was Saturday, October 15th. It went from the 5th to the 15th. They added 10 days, and it was really an, an astronomical change they needed to make. There wasn't any conspiracy. They were doing it for the seasons and for farming. But when he changed the 5th of October to the 15th, he changed the calendar. It did nothing to the days of the week. Friday was followed by Saturday. See what I'm saying? That's why your birthday might be on a different day of the week every year. Because people look at a calendar and they see the days of the week on a calendar and they see the month, they think when you change the month, it affects the week. It has nothing to do with the week. So that argument really has, holds no water at all. Then, you know, for me, what's one of the very compelling arguments is in the Bible it tells us what day the seventh day is. You read in Luke chapter 23, verse 54 through 24, when Christ died, it says, they returned and prepared spices and ointments and they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. By the way, this is written by Luke, a Gentile, written 20 years after the cross. Would have been a good place for him to introduce the new Christian Sabbath if there was one, but he doesn't. And I think it's interesting that Jesus chose Friday afternoon as the Sabbath was about to, get, to begin to say it is finished. He went to sleep. He rested through the Sabbath from his work of saving mankind. And he rose Sunday to continue his work as our high priest, not to establish a new day of rest. Jesus even kept the Sabbath in his death. So you look in the Bible and commonly we think of Friday, they call it Good Friday, it was the day he was crucified. It's the preparation day, the Bible says. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was about to begin. After the Sabbath was passed, they came to the tomb. As the first day began to dawn, that would be what we commonly call Sunday morning. I have no dispute that Jesus rose Sunday morning. Question is, does that make it a new Sabbath day? 
Jesus died on Friday. Does that make that a new Sabbath day? The Lord's Supper was celebrated on a Thursday. Does that make that a new Sabbath day? Jesus did wonderful things on many different days of the week, but there was nothing wrong with the original Sabbath. Why would he change it? Does that make sense? Somebody please say amen. amen. I realize we're not in a church, but it'll help me. So we know the day between Friday when he died on the cross and Sunday when he rose is what day? What's between Friday and Sunday? Quick. Saturday. Saturday. There you go. It hasn't changed. Matter of fact, most Christians that go to church on Sunday, they have no dispute that Sunday is the first day of the week. They just argue the reasons for keeping it that day. But they still fail to produce a commandment. And then one of the other, for me, compelling arguments about what day it is, is you've got a whole race of people around the world. What did I say last night? 15 million Jews around the world. And they know what their holy day is, and it has not changed ever since uh, at least the Exodus, right? You think I could see one or two people going into a coma and waking up and forgetting the days of the week, but for the whole nation to forget is not very likely. We know what day the seventh day is. We also know what happened. Matter of fact, in 108 languages of the world, the word for what we call Saturday is Sabbath. Anyone here speak Spanish? Sabado. Sabbath day. That's Spanish. Seventh day of the week. Saturday. Russian. Subota. And many, many other languages where I've been. It's um, Sabbath day. They call it the Sabbath. The word for the seventh day is the Sabbath, even though they may go to church on the first day of the week. Question number three. This is simple. When does the Sabbath begin? Do we start keeping the Sabbath midnight or two in the morning when the daylight savings time changes? It tells us clearly in the Bible, Leviticus 23, verse 32, from evening to evening you'll celebrate your Sabbath. It begins at sundown. Again, Mark 1, verse 32. And at evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all those who were sick. They waited till the Sabbath was over at sundown and uh, he healed the sick and those who were demon-possessed. Now the big question is, if we're Christians, we follow Christ. What day, question four, did Jesus keep as the Sabbath? I want to follow Jesus, don't you? If you follow Jesus and you're a Christian, you, you can't go wrong. It says in Mark 6, verse 2, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Jesus had a pattern of teaching in the synagogue. He went, the synagogue means gathering. He went to the church on the Sabbath day. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood to read. Jesus went to church on the Sabbath day. He read the scriptures on the Sabbath day. If you follow his pattern, and he never told the disciples to do anything otherwise. Matter of fact, Christ, we're talking about the end of the world. He said that we should pray, Matthew 24, verse 20, pray that your flight might not be in the winter. It's not talking about an airline flight. It's talking about fleeing for your lives. Pray that your flight might not be in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Jesus, looking down in history, prophesied his people would still be keeping the Sabbath and they would pray they would not have to flee on that day. That tells us something about his recognizing how important it is. Some people think that Jesus came to do away with the Sabbath because occasionally he'd heal people or do things like that. He'd do deeds of goodness on the Sabbath. Yes, he came to help take away some of the misconceptions about the Sabbath. He clarified the Sabbath truth because there were a number of man-made laws that had been attached to it. But he did not do away with it. It's still holy. He kept it by his example. Number five, did early Christians keep the Sabbath? I mean, what was the pattern according to the Bible? It says in Acts chapter 17, verse 1, they came to Thessalonica where was there, there was a synagogue of the Jews. And then Paul, oh well, it tells us that uh, they went into the synagogues. And then Paul, as his custom was, went to them and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the scriptures. And not only did he do it with the Gentiles or the Jews, it says, then the Gentiles begged that they might have these words preached to them the next Sabbath. Jew, Gentile, they met on the Sabbath day in the New Testament. Matter of fact, I understand you can find over a hundred examples if you add them up of the disciples keeping the seventh day Sabbath in the New Testament. You go to Acts chapter 16. Well, matter of fact, Acts 13, 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God, Jew and Gentile. Acts 16, verse 13. Of course, again, written by Luke, a Gentile. 
And on the Sabbath, we, Luke could have said, you know, we are keeping the Jewish Sabbath, the old Jewish Sabbath, or the, if there's a new day, they never say anything about that because they all understood what day it was. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to a riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and we spoke to the women who met there. All through the Roman Empire, they knew that God's people kept the seventh day Sabbath. One of the greatest arguments, I think, about the practice of the New Testament church is in Luke 23, 56, when Christ died and they were not finished embalming his body with their incredible love for him, they still would not violate the sacred hours of the Sabbath to embalm his body. So many people would argue today, well, the ox is in the ditch. We really ought to finish up what we're doing. His disciples from spending three and a half years with Jesus knew that he would not be pleased with that. So they waited until Sunday morning to finish. Why? Because they believed that it would displease the Lord for them to violate it in that way. Or at least they felt, thought it was a violation. They never got any idea from Jesus that it had been done away with. Or why would they do that? Number six, are the Ten Commandments still valid today? I believe they are, friends. Jesus said, it's easier, Luke 16, 17, for a heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. God's law is perfect. God's law does not need to be changed. The purpose for the gospel is to transform us. We are what needs changing, friends. Yet so many in the church are trying to change the standards of God to accommodate man's sinfulness. No, the purpose of the gospel is to lift man up from his sinfulness to God's purity. Amen? Revelation 22, 14, blessed are those, the blessing in the Sabbath, who do his commandments, that they might have a right to the tree of life and enter through the gates of the city. God expects his people to keep them. Again, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, God's law has not changed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And again, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, he says, I am the Lord, I change not. You know, that's one reason that we went with this theme of rock for this series. The Word of God is like a rock. Christ is our rock, and the Ten Commandments are written on a rock. It doesn't change. God could have used paper. Ceremonial laws were written on some other parchment or leather, but the Ten Commandments, God wrote Himself, spoke with His own voice, wrote it in stone. If He was going to change one of them, I don't know that He would have done it that way if it was temporary or passing in nature, but it was because of its permanent nature that He did it that way. Right now, we're living in the time of the New Covenant. Old Covenant was the law of God written on the stone. The New Covenant, he says, I'll write my law on their hearts. You notice he doesn't say a different law. It's the same law, but it's written in the heart now. Love is the fulfilling of the law. If you love God, you'll keep the first four. If you love your fellow man, you'll keep the last six. Number seven, does one commandment matter? I mean, as long as you're doing 90%, that's not so bad, is it? You know, if you're in elementary school and you get a 90, you feel pretty good. It doesn't work that way with God's law. James chapter 2, verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Those of you who think that 90% is okay, well, that depends on which law it is. I don't think there's too many here that would think that the seventh commandment, you don't mind as long as your spouse keeps the other nine, they can break the seventh. You all know what the seventh is. That's the one about adultery. 90%. Would you accept that argument? I'm keeping 90%, dear. How many of you would accept that argument? You see, because if you love somebody, you wouldn't even think of offering that as a suggestion. God is saying, what about your time with me? You're going to tell me that one doesn't matter? Well, it's a serious thing. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 19, Whoever, whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments, specifically, or at least the ten, and shall teach men so, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, whenever you're in doubt about what to do, first of all, follow Jesus' example and you're safe. Secondly, do the safe thing. I know that I'm not in trouble come judgment day because I'm keeping the fourth commandment along with the other nine. And it always strikes me as very strange I've preached in many different churches. I've preached in Nazarene, Foursquare, Assembly of God, Baptist, Church of Christ, Methodist. I've lost count. I've spoken in many different churches. That's why I know that there are godly 
spirit-led, lovely people in these different churches. Some have just not heard the truth. Jesus said, I've got other sheep that are not of this fold, but they're going to hear my voice and they're going to take a stand in the last days. But I always think it's odd. I know these churches. I know what they believe. I could go to most of those churches and I could say, thank you for inviting me to preach. Today I'm going to talk about not worshiping other gods and I'd get a lot of amens. I could talk about not stealing. I could talk about any of the other nine commandments and I'd probably get a hearty amen. Of course, there is one church, if I talked about idolatry, they'd be uncomfortable. But the others, 90%, they'd be very, very happy with. But if I were to start saying, keep the Sabbath day, they'd actually be okay. But if I said, on the day that God blessed the seventh day, they would be, they'd fold their arms, they'd sit back in their chairs, they'd say, legalism, not under the law. Doesn't that sound strange? Something strange on the range, as they say. <laughs> Among Christians that would be nervous and so restless about keeping one of God's commandments. It's a serious sin. One time a man during the Exodus experience was caught breaking the Sabbath. Moses wasn't sure what to do. They brought the case before the Lord. And you know what God said? Bring him before the people and stone him to death. Now, we don't live in that society today. They would stone when people would break a number of the commandments. It was capital punishment, especially the first four commandments. Capital punishment when God was right in their midst. But the Sabbath commandment, how important does God feel about that? Does he feel like it's less of a sin now? Some of us have just thought, well, you know, it's a little commandment. What did Jesus say? Whosoever shall break one of the least of these? It's not a little one, trust me, friends. If it was so little, the devil wouldn't hate it so much. You're usually safe loving what the devil hates. Did you catch that? <laughs> Will we keep the Sabbath in eternity? Isaiah 66, verse 22. It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And he's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. And it will come to pass that from one new moon to another, and it goes on to say from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh, I say all Jews, all flesh come and worship before me in heaven. And who do you think the preacher will be when you go to church in heaven? Jesus. And will anybody sleep during the sermon at that point? No. Now, follow me, please. We already know that God created the Sabbath back in the beginning with Adam. We know that they kept it in the Old Testament. Whenever they forgot about it, the Lord would remind them. We know that Jesus and the apostles kept it. I could show you from history that the early church kept it until four or five hundred years. As a matter of fact, there have been Christians through the ages that have kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. Why would we not keep it now? We're going to keep it in heaven? Why would there be this one brief period of time where God was going to change days or do away with it? It just doesn't make sense, friends. People of God have been under attack because the devil is attacking the relationship. In heaven, we'll be keeping the Sabbath day. It'll be a time of resting with God. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. And I'll tell you, the ultimate coming to Jesus is when he comes to pick us up and take us back to glory. Amen? And that will be, we're going to spend a millennium Sabbath with him. First 1,000 years, it's going to be like a Sabbath to recuperate from this world. Number nine, why do religious leaders ignore the Sabbath truth? You know, this is a prophecy. It's not original. It did not happen recently. Why do the religious leaders ignore it? You can read in Mark chapter 7, verse 9, Jesus said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you might keep your tradition." Putting aside a clear commandment of God, it's not new for religious leaders to favor traditions of their institution rather than the clear commandments of God's Word. And again, Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Again, Ezekiel 22, verse 26 and verse 31, he says, Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane and they've hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. When God tells us that the Sabbath is his holy day, it's the Sabbath of the Lord, and we say it just doesn't matter, how can we say he has our heart when he doesn't have our time? 
let's face it, it's easier for some people to give God their money than their time. I think many of us probably had fathers where you could give your kids a trinket or a toy but didn't have enough time. And love shows that you care by investing time. And people say, Lord, Lord, but they don't want to give them the seventh day. Number 10, what should I do about the Sabbath truth? How should I respond to these things? Well, Jesus tells us, John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. He wants us to show our love for him by keeping it. And furthermore, the Lord says in John chapter 13, verse 17, if you know these things, happy, does he say miserable? Happy are ye if you do them. Why am I sharing these things with you? To make problems? Well, it doesn't say there aren't any problems in following the Lord, but ultimately you will be much happier. I had a person came to a presentation like this, and they told me afterward, Pastor Doug, I wish I'd never come. I said, why? He says, because what you said makes sense, and now I know, and I don't want to change. Now I'm miserable. I said, I'll pray for you. You'll continue to be miserable until you surrender. <laughs> the Lord didn't send it to you and to make a problem. He sent it to you because he's trusting you with truth. And when you take a stand for the truth, there's a blessing that will come from that. Well, think about it. Worst thing that can happen is you take a stand for the Sabbath truth and you get killed for it. And if you die standing for Jesus, what's the next thing you're aware of? Your problems are over. Be the best thing ever happened to you, right? I mean, we sometimes think that this life is what it's all about. This life's preparing for the one that really matters. And we forget, think this is it. This is not it. If we haven't got time to give Jesus one day a week in seven, how are you going to endure eternity with him? We don't have enough faith to get to church once a week. How are we going to have enough faith to get to heaven? Oh, I better save that. I've got something else to say on that point. <laughs> Isaiah 58, verse 13. There's promises that go with it. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, the foot in the Bible, stepping on something in disrespect, and call the Sabbath a delight. It's a delight. Holy day of the Lord and honorable, and you'll honor him. You're not honoring a church or an institution or a pastor. It's honoring God. Not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you will delight yourself in the Lord. What does God associate with keeping the Sabbath? Delight. And I'll cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. He'll cause you to ride on the high places of the earth. You know, when, uh, when the children of Israel were getting ready to enter into the promised land, God said to Moses, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. The very promised land was a symbol of that rest that God was going to give them. But he, the devil doesn't want you to have that rest. He wants to keep us so busy with the cares of this life that the day of the Lord overtakes us as a thief. Every Sabbath day, we put the brake on and we recalibrate. We get our priorities straight, and the devil doesn't want us to do that. And even in God's remnant church, we're getting very sloppy about how we're keeping the Sabbath. Matter of fact, I'm going to go so far as to say, I'll bet you that if you go 100 years back, most Sunday keepers were keeping Sunday better than many Sabbath keepers are now keeping the Sabbath. That's true. I've talked to a lot of folks that are cut from the old cloth. They maybe even went the wrong day, but they're, they were very strict about keeping it. And the devil is now doing to God's church what he's done to many others. And we're, I mean, let's face it, a lot of folks go to church on Sunday, then they go to the mall, they go to the movies, they go to the football game, mow their lawn. It's just, it's not even a Sabbath for those who say it's a different day. If, let's get the day right, but let's not stop there. Let's keep it holy. Number 11, important question. How did so many people start keeping Sunday on the first day of the week? Well, you can start, oh, there's so much I could say on this. The earliest recognition, this is the Encyclopedia Britannica 11th edition on the article on Sunday. The earliest recognition of the observance of Sunday as a legal duty is a constitution of Constantine, this is Constantine the Great, 
enacting that all courts of justice, inhabitants of towns and workshops be, uh, were to rest on Sunday, and they called that the venerable day of the sun, venerable day solace. It wasn't having anything to do with the Son of God. It had to do with sun worship and Mithra, with the exception of those who were engaged in agricultural labor. He published the Edict of Milan. He established Sunday as a day of worship. And many of the Christians who were trying to get in with the new supposed Christian emperor, they began to little by little drift away from the Sabbath of the seventh day because they were having problems with the Jews. And they wanted to create a separation between themselves and the Jews. And so they said, well, we, we're going to keep the more popular Roman Sabbath. And they began to distance themselves from the Jewish Sabbath, not because of any scripture, but because of political pressure. It was politically correct to do what the emperor was doing. Now, you can go right to the Converts Catechism of the Catholic Church. They're very honest about this. And I could just give you a whole plethora of information and history on this. Wish I had more time. Matter of fact, there's a website. It's called SabbathTruth.com. SabbathTruth.com.net.org will take you to this very important website that's got a lot more history on this subject. And I hope that all of our friends who are looking, all the history, these quotes I'm sharing and many more are there. Let's go back. Let me finish that uh, catechism quote, Cheryl. I kind of changed gears on her while I was thinking about it. It says, uh, question. This is a ca Catholic catechism. They taught with question answer format, format. Which day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday's the Sabbath day. Well, the next natural question is, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the, the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. They freely admitted that. It, it happened back in the early days of the movement there in Rome where it originated and it spread through the empire. You can go right to the Catholic Encycl Encyclopedia. Volume 4, page 153. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or the seventh day of the week, you notice the church, not the Bible, then made the third commandment refer to Sunday. They did away with the second commandment that has to do with idolatry. The third commandment referred to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. It is so clear from history. The big question is, why won't Bible Christians take a stand? So many Christian movements have come out of the dark ages back to the Bible, but they stopped with one of God's commandments, the one that deals with the love relationship and giving God your time and your life. The Bible foretold in prophecy the beast power would think to change times and laws. There's only one law that is a law and a time. That's the Sabbath commandment. Am I right? You know, I don't have a lot of time for this next question. Maybe we'll do this during our question time tomorrow, but I'm going to read it to you. How do I keep the Sabbath day? What are some practical things that we should do or not do to keep the Sabbath day? Tell you what, I'm going to stop right there. Well, how much time? I yeah, I better stop right there. And I just want to pause here and kind of collect this. I'll, I'll talk about some of that maybe during our question time tomorrow. You've heard a lot tonight, friends. I have not told you half of what I could say on this subject. This is one of God's commandments. If I were to tell you that during the weekend, the Michigan government has changed the speed limit, you can now go 90 miles an hour on the interstate. Does anyone here believe me? Nobody you can try it out. Try and see what happens. <laughs> Let me know tomorrow. Why don't you believe me? because no responsible government would have such a prominent law that affects so many citizens that would not thoroughly advertise a change in that law. How in the world can Christians think that one of God's commandments spoken with his audible voice thundering from a mountain, burning with ark letters into stone, Moses broke the first set, he came back, he said, I'm giving it to you again. Same exact thing, unchangeable. God's going to deliver his law that way. He's going to change the one commandment that says remember and silence in the Bible on that. Come on, friends. We might cr come up with all these very creative rationalizations and arguments about why we don't want to give God our time, but let's be honest and call the truth the truth. If we're having problems, say, Lord, this makes sense, but I'm struggling, and pray that God don't go by what you feel. Don't go by what your pastor says. Don't go by what I say. Go by what the Bible says. And the Bible is very clear. God's law has not changed. 
Jesus wants you to have that rest. The devil wants you to work yourself to death. When Moses came to liberate God's people from their bondage, the Pharaoh was mad. He said, you're making the people rest. You know what that word is? You are making the people Sabbath. That Pharaoh's the devil. And that's how the devil feels today. Before the great deliverance in the days of Moses, there was a revival of the Sabbath truth. Before Jesus comes to deliver us from our bondage, there's going to be plagues again and a revival of the Sabbath truth among God's people. Amen. And I think it's time that revival starts. Amen, friends? Amen. And it better begin here at home. God's given the message to us. Amen? Amen? I'd like to invite John to come out. He's going to sing before I pray. And I want you to pray about keeping this day of rest that God has provided for us in his word. Oh, day of rest and gladness, oh, day of joy and light, oh, balm of cheer and sadness, most beautiful, most bright, on thee. I remember, thank you, John. Praise the Lord. I remember when I first heard these things. You know, for a while, I think I was even a little angry because among the 14 different schools I went to growing up, I went to a few Christian schools. I'd never heard this, and it was so simple. And it almost seemed to me that there was some conspiracy. It was like an identity theft, there was a substitution. You know, the devil is very clever. Through history, he's shown that he can separate God's people from the source of their strength by tempting them to disobey. God can put a wall and a hedge of protection about us. He can put a pillar of fire between us and the enemy. But if we are willingly refusing to obey his law when we know his will, he, he must withdraw that protection. And we suffer. And in the last days, the devil's been very clever. He's not telling us so much. Well, first he'll say, don't keep the Sabbath. You don't need it. Law's done away with. Not under the law now. Do whatever you want all the time. Don't give any time to God. And then he says, if you're convinced the Sabbath's still there, all right, if you're going to keep it, just don't keep it on the day that God tells you to keep it. Such a little, subtle difference. Someone might say, what difference does it make? It's a big test. Do you trust the Lord? Are you going to do it His way, His day? You take a step in faith and say, Lord, I'm willing to do your will. I'm going to do what you say, not the first day or the fifth day, but the seventh day. I'm going to keep your law. Did it make a difference how many times Joshua marched around Jericho? Was God particular? Did it make a difference how many times Nahum and Washington, the Jordan River? Does God mean what he says? And you will get a blessing if you take a stand for truth, friends. Is that your desire? Can I pray with you? Father in heaven, dear Lord, I pray that you'll be with each person who is listening right now. And I pray that the power and the impact 
of the simple truth of your word will be sealed in their hearts through the grace of the Holy Spirit. Bring these things to life, Lord. I pray that you'll just take the scales from their eyes and help them to see that your truth and your law has never changed and that you are calling people together to come to you for that rest. Bless these meetings and each person. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends. Next meeting is tomorrow night, Confusion in the Cemetery. We hope you'll come.